I think we can now go ahead and get, and get started. Um, I, I just wanted to, on behalf of the Human Rights Initiative here at CEU, uh, thank you for coming to this discussion tonight about, um, about the, the, the fourth uh, constitutional amendment that was just passed uh, this Monday um, here in Hungary. Um, and I think uh, that one of the reasons we decided to have this, uh, this type of discussion with these types of civil, civil society groups and NGOs here is to, to attempt to have a, just a constructive conversation about ways to, to think about, um, to think about like, the, the, the implications of this constitution and uh, how to move forward um, and try to, just to have some ideas about how to, 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 to move together um, against these, uh, the measures that, that have been written into the constitution. Um, so yeah, and so again, thanks for coming. I'll talk to Amon, who is a really a big part, um, really the, the person who organized this whole event. I uh, will say a few words, and um, then we'll get started. Thanks a lot. Hi, um, hello to everyone. Welcome to this uh, roundtable discussion. I don't want to talk too much about uh, um, the amendments because uh, Nora and Esther are going to talk about. Um, those in greater detail. I just want to have, uh, I just want to give a short, a short way on how this event was organized. Um, um, I'm an MA student here at CEU, but I'm also an activist at the City Scroll Group, the Mark Community Report, which is an advocacy group of homeless people and we were, uh, we found these amendments very problematic because of the criminalization of, of homeless people. Um, but we were not the only ones who critiqued the amendments, but also, and I have a long list, I just wanted to show that a lot of people have critiqued these amendments, for example, uh, the Constitutional Court, because most of these amendments were um, notified before by the Constitutional Law, the Hungarian Ombudsman, and the human rights activists and organizations like the Helsinki Committee, Amnesty International, and the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union, and then um, the Council of Europe, José Manuel Boruso, the President of the European Commission, the U.S. government, and um, uh, Angela Merkel and Guido Westerwell, I just today talking about this. Um, so that's what I wanted to say. First, I would like to introduce you our guest. Um, Esther Wagari from uh, the Department of Legal Studies here from CEU, uh, Nora Novosade from the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, um, Bertrandi Lakatos from the Varus Mindenki, the Cities for All, um, Damia Gézsabó from the Student Network, Hagatul Hamza, and Tomás Dombos from the Hungarian LGBT Alliance. And first, I would like to ask um, Esther, no. oh, sorry, Nora, <laughs> Nora to give a short introduction to you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, just a few words about why I am here, or why the Hungarian Housing Committee is involved in such a roundtable. Um, since uh, 2010, <coughs> we together in coalition with two other NGOs, the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union, also mentioned here, and the Otvashkari Institute, uh, are carrying out uh, advocacy uh, activities uh, regarding the constitutional changes in Hungary. We are also providing legal representation to, to a bunch of our clients who were uh, severely affected by these recent changes, both by amendments to the constitution, both by, by legal changes, and both by the fundamental law itself. Um, first of all, I really would like to emphasize that I, I work in a human rights NGO. Uh, I, I'm not a politician. I, I look at these changes from a human rights perspective, and I think it's very important to emphasize at every point that these changes affect uh, the rule of law, the, uh, they undermine the rule of law in Hungary, and they also threaten the level of protection of human rights uh, established in Hungary in the last decade. So there are basically three ways how this uh, amendment undermines the rule of law. The first thing is that it introduces a lot of uh, provisions into the fundamental law which were found unconstitutional beforehand by the constitutional law. 
So the Parliament adopted these provisions as acts of Parliament, as ordinary acts of Parliament. The Constitutional Court said that they, uh, they are unconstitutional and now they put them on a fundamental law level. So in this way they just overcome uh, the Constitutional Court and the message is whatever the Constitutional Court says we can just include it in the Constitution or not in the fundamental law and, that, and then the problem is solved. So that's the message but this whole uh, uh, way of, uh, of constitution making um, gives to us. The second thing is that <coughs> this recent amendments, uh, amendment, what we'll talk about here today, uh, also includes provisions in the fundamental law which are in clear violation of international standards. Uh, they were, some of them were criticized by the Venice Commission and some of them possibly or surely are in contradiction of the European Convention on Human Rights. And thirdly, which is also, of course, very important from a human rights perspective, uh, this uh, um, Fourth Amendment uh, weakens the control exercised by the Constitutional Court. Um, not only by giving this message that you can overcome the Constitutional Court rulings anytime you want, but also uh, through very exact uh, new rules. I will talk about them in a bit more detail later. So actually what we believe that this amendment undermines the stability and the enforceability of the fundamental law. It gives the message that the fundamental law it's, it's, uh, it's not a um, constant thing. You can, you can play with it anytime you want, which of course uh, will affect uh, the level of human rights protection, will affect the rule of law, so on. Uh, and what we believe that after adopting this amendment Actually, the Constitution um, ceases to qualify as a Constitution if we take into account uh, constitutional standards, like constitutional requirements in this regard. Um, and just a few more words about uh, <coughs> the background of the adoption uh, of this whole uh, Fourth Amendment. First, I'd just like to mention that this uh, Fourth Amendment was submitted by individual MPs of the governing coalition which under the Hungarian rules means that there is no public consultation beforehand. So normally if the government or the ministers prepare a bill, it's published on the website and normally you have the possibility, everybody has the possibility to comment on it on the internet, it's, it's an open public debate. This was not done here. We just heard that the Fidesz decided that there will be an amendment and in a few days you have had the bill in front of the parliament and you had no formal way of, uh, of debating it. And another very important thing is, and this goes back to the constitutional court which I would like to talk about, uh, it's the motive behind these amendments. Because um, the recent governing majority has a constant practice of uh, retaliation against the constitutional court. So, for example, there was I think that's the best example for it. Uh, there was an amend there was a law which uh, um, prescribed a very high 98 uh, percent um, tax. Thank you, uh, with a retroactive effect, and this was an ordinary act of parliament, and the constitutional court abolished it. The answer was that the constitution was amend was amended in a way that retroactive retroactive taxation is possible and at the same time the constitutional court's powers were restricted. So the recent amendments follow exactly the same uh, pattern uh, and I just would like to remind you or, or, or <coughs> tell you the, the fact that uh, just before this fourth amendment was submitted in the end of uh, December, January and so on, uh, for example the transitional provisions uh, of the fundamental law were abolished by the Constitutional Court, which said that most of the, or some of the provisions are not transitory in nature and they shouldn't have to include it in a transitional uh, provision part. Uh, the Constitutional Court also abolished the preliminary mandatory voting registration and abolished uh, rules uh, criminalizing <coughs> the homeless persons. Now, all of these, or not the preliminary uh, voting registration, but all of these will go 
uh, into the fundamental law. So it's clear that it's th the message again is very clear that um, even though the constitutional court says that something is unconstitutional, they just don't care about that. And and this was the casus belli for for um, adopting and submitting these uh, amendments. And I'm sorry for for being a bit long here in the beginning, but I think these are important procedural aspects. It's, I think it's also important that the messages sometimes from the government that, oh, we just included the transitional provisions into the fundamental law. It's a merely technical thing, which is of course not true. And it's, I think it's very important that everybody uh, has an, his or her mind as the thing. Um, and I just would like to talk about four uh, concrete amendments in this regard, I will try to be very brief, but of course, after that, I think we can have further questions if anything remains unclear. So, uh, the first thing is, which affects the which affects not only the constitutional court, but actually all of the bodies uh, which have the task of protecting human rights, is that the amendment declares that the constitutional court decisions which were adopted prior entering into force of the fundamental law, so prior uh, 2012 January 1st, uh, are void. We don't know what this ex exactly means. I mean, uh, we don't know exactly what uh, declaring a constitutional court decision void means, but it's quite clear from the wording and from the reasoning and from the whole uh, uh, concept that they are basically um, abolishing the constitutional court case law from the last two decades. They're basically abolishing uh, the constitutional court's practice since the democratic transition in Hungary, like entirely. Uh, and it, uh, of course, has this, of course, has very severe consequences. Is the denial of the constitutional continuity between the first two decades. Uh, of, of, the, of our democracy uh, and also um, has this effect that since you, since you don't, don't have to um, give reasons uh, for deferring from the previous constitutional court case law, it is very easy <coughs> to change the level of protection of human rights. So it's very easy to disregard a certain level of protection because you are not under the obligation to, to take into account the constitutional standards anymore which were established by the constitutional court in the last two decades. <coughs> um, it's also, like, now we are coming to the second um, concrete uh, amendment. Uh, the amendment bans the constitutional court to examine proposed and adopted constitutional amendments. It's a quite complex uh, problem because for a very long time the Hungarian constitutional court said that uh, if, um, if a bill is adopted as an amendment to the, co to the constitution, then the constitutional court has no power to review it. But recently, also of course because of these recent changes, uh, the Constitutional Court took up a new view and it said that it can also, in substance, so substance, it can also assess the substantive um, aspects of a constitutional amendment if it goes against the basic constitutional standards. Uh, <coughs> what I would like to emphasize here is that on the basis of this amendment, uh, basically if you have a governing majority uh, of two thirds, so if you have a constitutional, constitution-making majority, then you can um, overrule the constitutional court anytime you want, which of course you feel that it's not the way things should be. Uh, another thing is that there was a transitory restriction on the constitutional court's powers in budgetary matters, uh, which was made permanent by the, by the um, transitional provisions. But after the transitional provisions were abolished, now this restriction goes into the fundamental law. So now in budgetary matters uh, concerning taxes, so on, 
the constitutional court will have no word either. Uh, and one last thing, uh, sorry for me, it's so lovely. Um, and one last thing is uh, what is important uh, also from the perspective of the protection of, uh, of uh, um, fundamental rights that uh, the <coughs> amendment creates the constitutional basis for the transfer of cases by the president of the National Judicial Office. This basically means really briefly that the president of the National Judicial Office with, uh, may reassign any case to any court she wants, which means that this is a clear violation of uh, the right to a lawful judge because one single person decides without any objective criteria where uh, a certain case will dealt with. And I'm happy to talk about this in detail because uh, we really dealt a lot with this problem because it was also uh, created uh, by, a, uh, by a former act of parliament and now it goes to the, goes to the fundamental law. Uh, and it's also important in this regard that originally this uh, transfer of uh, cases system was reasoned uh, by the aim of reaching a balanced distribution of cases, like the balanced distribution of caseload. So the original version said that uh, it's just a transitory thing. So that's why it's in the transitional provisions, because it's a transitory thing. But now the amendment uh, doesn't include a reference to the transitory character. So the transfer of cases system uh, becomes permanent. Uh, well, that's basically the first part of what I wanted to say. I, I hope it was understood, but I'm really happy to to talk about thank later on. Thank you for, for the introduction and I just want to share some practical information that uh, now everyone, I mean everyone else will have 10 minutes to uh, talk. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Thank no. you for the legal background. We really did this, so it's okay. But um, the others will talk 10 minutes, then we will have another round about the solutions and then everyone has the opportunity to ask, to ask questions and, and comments and I just wanted to add that on, on the on the site of the Facebook event there is a PDF file so you can find the amendment in English if you are so now Esther is going to So Nora, Nora gave, a, gave already a brief introduction on, on why, and I, I just wanted to reflect a little bit on what, uh, what has been going on on the events Facebook site yesterday, that many of you, many of you called for a dialogue and, and complained about not having opposing views here. And as Nora said, that it's not that we are so elitist and we are so like entrenched in our liberal views that we don't want to talk about it with, with governing parties. The government has offered no possibility whatsoever to, to, to share views on the, on the amendment or to, to submit any kind of opinion on this, it's exactly because it was submitted by individual MPs and all the rules that were actually adopted by this government or by this parliament were circumvented simply uh, through the, the procedure of of, not, of having individual uh, members of parliament uh, as initiators of the bill. So that's just a little bit of clarification. I haven't checked in the past few hours whether the president signed it or not, uh, but Nora also drew attention, he hasn't, drew attention to, to that little bit of, like uh, to the door that the, the constitutional court opened for, for requesting uh, not only formal but substantive review from the constitutional court. It actually, the constitutional court made a, made a very, very smart move because they, they based their approach on a provision, or it's not even a provision, it's a sentence in the constitution which, or fundamental law, sorry. Uh, so it's in a, uh, which, which claims that it's uh, the first unified fundamental law of Hungary. And the Constitutional Court claims that uh, it constitutes a uh, um, formal um, like nullity if, if, the, if the parliament over constitutionalizes what has been already found unconstitutional by the Constitutional Court. 
they actually very much foresaw this coming, that the parliament will simply put everything that was contested by the constitutional court into the, into the text of the, of the fundamental law. So this is actually, the constitutional court claims that this uh, infringes the coherence of the, fun, uh, of the fundamental law, and in these cases, this might be reviewed beyond the, the procedural requirements of the, of the adoption. It's yet to be seen whether the, uh, the president makes the move or not. I pretty much doubt, but let's hope. Um, Nora mentioned already a few, few concrete amendments, um, and the, the rest of the group will talk <coughs> about very specific ones, so I get the remaining ones. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and, and I, I'm actually happy that I got freedom of religion and the church law, because that illustrates very much how, the, how this struggle goes between the constitutional court and the parliament. And without going into, into very much into details of, the, of this whole church registration and, and everything uh, that relates to that, uh, just a few words how this whole saga developed in the, in the past few, it's, a, it's over, over a year by now. So the first church law was passed by, uh, by the parliament in, it's a cardinal law, so it's two-third majority in 2011 in the summer. Uh, this completely went against the, the previous regime, which was a very liberal one. This, like, this one requires a lot more presence in Hungary, or it requires, a, there is a presence requirement and there is a support requirement in, in the law. But what has changed and that was, I think, the major change is that the registration or recognition of churches was taken away from courts and given, were given, well, was given to the to the parliament. So from a from a judicial body, it was taken to a political body. And this law was, of course, challenged before the constitutional court. The constitutional court found uh, it unconstitutional on the basis of, of procedural irregularities. And even before the, the decision was published, the parliament withdrew the, the law and adopted a new one two days later, which is pretty much the same that uh, entered into force two days after. So it was uh, adopted on, on the 30th of December and entered into force on the 1st of January. Uh, that law was again challenged by, by, by churches which were not <coughs> recognized and the Constitutional Court uh, found it unconstitutional, again, on uh, substantive grounds. And what happens now is that the, the, the Parliament, in, the, in this amendment, creates the legal basis for the very exact same church law in the Constitution, or in the fundamental law now. So what is, we don't know what will happen, but it, it seems that it seems that it seems very likely that the exact same law will be passed for the third time, and and that's that's going that has been going on, and it's like uh, even though the the church law prescribes clear requirements for for recognition, uh, no church so far was recognized beyond the ones that were were recognized by the parliament in. In the law, so there was a first round uh, in the annex of the of the law. There are like 14 churches, I think, and there were another 16 added through an amendment to the law. But it's a formal amendment, so there is no procedure, there is no implementation law attached to it. So no one knows how it's going to work, and and the ones it's it's very interesting that the ones that were recognized in the second round didn't even apply for it. <laughs> for recognition, they were recognized without actually fulfilling the criteria in the law itself. So there were reasons behind that there are four ambassadors in, in, in Budapest which, or who attend the, the Anglican Church. It would be a pity not to, to, to recognize the Anglican Church. Or the Copts are persecuted in many countries, like we send out a message, Hungary, from here, that this, this should be, like they are a proper church, they should be recognized. They don't meet the criteria by other churches who wanted to be recognized could not get this so far. So that's, that's how we stand now. The, the Constitutional Court quashed the law retroactively 
So at the moment, it seems that we are back in back before summer 2011. So all the churches that were registered on the basis of the 1990 law should be should regain their status. They most likely will not. But it's it's a it's a legal uncertainty in that regard. Uh, the constitutional court actually uh, found it unconstitutional that uh, the political advertising, political campaigning in the media was restricted by the parliament. Uh, what happens now that you will find a, find a provision, the relevant provision in the, in the constitutional <coughs> amendment, which says that uh, in the name of fairness, uh, political advertising should be done for free in the public media, but there is a limitation on that only for those parties that have national party lists, so which are big parties uh, in general. So not all the parties can have, so there is a minimum requirement to that, but we don't have a, an election procedure law yet, so it's hard to be seen, but what actually means that you have a, you have a national party list. But there is a, it, it is a serious limitation on, on freedom of speech, and especially political speech, because it restricts it or limits political advertising and political campaigning to the public media. So if you know about Hungarian public media, so it's not really the most impartial uh, news channel in Hungary. So it's, it's not the broad coverage that is actually prescribed by the European Convention either. So the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights uh, points into a completely different direction, no matter <laughs> the Hungarian uh, parliament, uh, parliament passed it. And there was one more, one more amendment that I need to talk about, and my colleague later on will tell a lot more about it, the criminalization of homelessness. That was um, passed in the, in the act of, on misdemeanors, like petty crimes, that was found unconstitutional because it violated the, the human dignity, the right to human dignity by the constitutional court. Now it, it comes back as a little bit more detailed, a detailed provision that has three paragraphs. The first two uh, prescribe what the state and the municipalities need to aim at. So these are clear aspirational provisions. These are not rights, these are not justiciable. These are not claims that you can go to court with. So it's like the state aims at providing housing, decent housing for, for everyone kind of provision. And the third one opens up the, the way to, to municipalities uh, to criminalize homelessness in their own jurisdictions, uh, which the government, and it's really like what really pisses me off in this whole thing, story is that the government uh, reasoning behind is that like the, the first two so criminalization is is just the last resort it can only happen if the first two provisions are met and the first two goals are met but the text of the, uh, the, the amendment doesn't read this way so again there is a there is a double talk very clearly in that and just one one more last I don't see the clock. So there was one more last thought, and that comes from my from my human rights lawyer soul. Is that if you if you look at what what has been going on with freedom of religion, also a little bit with families, that Thomas will talk a little <coughs> bit more about it, uh, and also with with homelessness, the issue of housing, is that the 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 language of or the rhetoric of the of the debate has move from, from a rights-based approach very much to a, I'm the state, I'm doing a favor, like be happy and be grateful for that. So it's not a rights-based approach anymore. So n nobody talks about freedom of religion. So exercising freedom of religion in community or having your church recognized is not a human rights issue anymore. The same goes for homelessness very much. It's a, it's a problem, it's a, it's a threat to, to public order, it's a, it's a threat to, to public health. We need to protect our cultural heritage and that's part of the, part of the text in the, con, uh, in the fundamental law and in the amendment. So it's not about like human dignity anymore, it's about preserving like the clean 
streets and preserving public order. So there is a there is a very strong tendency that also Nora a little bit pointed pointed to. Thank Thank you. <laughs> and now that Manila covers the activists of the cities for a we to talk about um, <coughs> the amendments affected her and the uh, homeless people in general. And uh, she's going to talk in Hungarian, but it's still different states. <coughs> A város mindenki hajléktalan aktivistája vagyok. So she is the uh, homeless activist of the Cities for All, which is an NGO. Szeretném elmondani, hogy a város mindenki munkacsoport hajléktalan emberekből és szövetségeseikből áll. So this NGO is made up uh, of uh, homeless people and their uh, uh, friends or maybe uh, people who help them. Célunk a hajléktalan emberek jogi védelme. And their aim is to protect the rights of homeless people. Szeretnénk elérni, hogy a hajléktalanság felszámolásában változások következzenek be jó irányba. They want uh, positive changes in uh, the, uh, the abolition of homelessness. Or, uh, yeah. És szeretnénk a hajléktalan embereknek a lakhatáshoz való jogot törvénybe iktatni, iktattatni, tehát csak szeretnénk azt hiszem. Uh, they strive to, strive to achieve that uh, the uh, right to housing is uh, made, made uh, to law. Amiért én most itt vagyok, annak az az oka, hogy a város mindenkié ezzel az új alaptörvényjel kétségbe van esve, és hogy értékelhető legyen miért, szeretném visszavezetni a szabálysértési törvény alatt ért sérelmeket a hajléktalan emberekkel. So the cities is for all is uh, desperate because of this uh, new ruling and uh, this new amendment, and uh, she wants to talk about the history of this uh, whole situation to make, make it more clear. 2010 őszén módosították az építési törvényt, amelynek az lett az eredménye, hogy az önkormányzatok felhasználmazást kaptak arra, hogy a hajléktalan embereket közterületekről kitiltsák. In 2010 a new ro- uh, law was passed and uh, the uh, city had the power to uh, prohibit the re- residing of uh, people in uh, public spaces. Ezzel elsőnek a fővárosért szabálytörtésre nyilvánította a közterületen való életvitelszerű tartózkodást, ami 50 ezertől 150 ezer forintos bérszágig terjedt. So, uh, residing in a public space became a contravention, and uh, it uh, could result in a fining from uh, 50,000 to 150,000 forints. Uh, Ha szeretném számokkal értékeltetni, csak Budapesten több mint 2000 hajléktalan embert másfél millió forintra büntettek meg. Uh, just in Budapest, uh, more than 2000 homeless people were fined uh, for more than 40 million forints. In, in which period? In 2011, in the spring. 2011 tavasza, ugye? Igen. Ebben vezető szerepet játszott a várkerület, tehát ahol a köztársasági elnökünknek van a palotája. Ott 33 hajléktalan embertől különböző napi négyszer igazoltatással különböző összegeket hoztak ki. Uh, the leading district of this process was the first uh, district, and uh, there uh, four, four identifications per day happened for some homeless people, and uh, more than uh, more than 31 people were identified. 2011. December, 
A kormánypárti frakció elfogadja a szabálysörtési törvényt, ami most már országosszá növégy ki magát. Uh, in 2011, in December, the uh, ruling party uh, accepted the law, uh, which made uh, residing in, the, in public space a contravention, and, and so this law became a, uh, I don't know, so, so the whole, whole country became affected by this law. És ennek kapcsán érdemes a számokat meghallgatni. 2012. áprilisban 3504. In 2012. April uh, 3504 uh, people. Júliusban 9720. In July 9, uh, 97000 people. Augustusban 15454. In August uh, 1554 people. Októberben 23896. In October uh, 23896 people. Hajléktalan ember büntetésének az átváltoztatását börtönre kérték. Mert vagy nem tudták kifizetni a büntetést, vagy nem tudták a közmunkát elvégezni. So because uh, these uh, homeless people were unable to uh, work uh, these fines or, or uh, pay them, uh, they were uh, put to prison effectively. A szabálysörtési törvény elfogadása után a város mindenkié, ami csak lehetett, és ami adva volt, mindent megpróbált. Petíciókat, elektromos leveleket, kérelmeket írtunk mindenhova. So, uh, after uh, this law, the city for all uh, tried every possible uh, measure, and they uh, petitioned, and they wrote uh, letters to every uh, organization they could. Szakemberek, szervezetek és érintettek közreműködésével Tárgyalni szerettünk volna. Uh, they wanted to uh, discuss these matters with policy makers and uh, with civilians, with the NGOs. Kerekasztal meghívásokat próbáltunk kieszködölni, és minden kísérletünk kudarcba pullat, elzárkoztak előlünk. Uh, they wanted to discuss these, table, uh, these uh, issues in uh, round table panels, but uh, Uh, these, uh, these were not successful. <coughs> Közben Tarlós István főpolgármester aluljáró tisztogatást végzett a fővárosban. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the mayor István Tarlós uh, started the cleansing of the underpasses. Kiüldött minden hajléktalan embert az aluljárók területéről, és akik kimentek külterületre, Később adoknak a kunyhói ellen kiadtak egy rombolási parancsot. So they prohibited the uh, residing in, in the underpasses, and uh, after that the huts were demolished, the huts of the uh, homeless people. Ez alatt az időszak alatt 8. kerületi Kocsis Máté polgármester, aki jelenleg kormányszóvivő, büntethetővé tette a utcán való alvást, valamint a kukázást. So meanwhile, uh, mayor of the 8th district, Kocsi Smáté, who is now a spokesperson of the government. Uh, sorry, not the government, but the Fidesz. Oh, okay, so spokesperson of the Fidesz. Varsi. Uh, uh, criminalized uh, residing in public space. Az ABM úgy tudott erre visszaválaszolni, hogy megrendeztük a Gubera kampányt, tehát szövetségeseinkkel együtt szépen kukáztuk. So uh, the cities for all, in return, uh, did a campaign which uh, which was about uh, the uh, people of the AVM and their uh, friends. Just made made a kind of a flash mob, or. A, a Ugyanúgy a szabálysértési törvény alatt elkezdték büntetni azokat a hajléktalan embereket, akik a pedél nélküli újságot árulják, ami nekik munka. 
so uh, selling the newspaper called Fadiel Neakul, uh, which which is uh, the work of some homeless people, was also criminalized. Rendeltetileg pedig koldulat. Uh, hogy ezt a fordulásnak tekintjék, és ezért de én voltam az, hogy biztosítják. Azt látják, hogy árulják a újságot, és akkor azonosítják őket a rendőről. Um, és azt mondják nekik, hogy menjenek el onnan. És időnként megbírságolják őket a kiregetésén. És emiatt a panaszt emelhetnek a hajléktalan emberek, de nem mindenki teszi meg. És akkor ugyanez alatt a szabálysértési időszak alatt nem érkezik meg a hajléktalan ellátó szervezetekhez a krízis időszakra előírt állami támogatás. So uh, in the same period uh, the uh, social social structure which deals with the homeless people doesn't get the money which it needs for the uh, crisis uh, intervention. Melyel szintén a hajléktalan emberek létét korlátozzák, illetve Fenet ugye szerintem veszélyeztetik, igen. Which is a danger to the lives of homeless people. Az ABM az Emberi Erőforrások Minisztériuma előtt megrendette a hullazsákos tüntetést. So uh, the Cities for All uh, made a demonstration with uh, body bags in front of uh, the uh, Minister of uh, Human Resources. És közben a kunyhó bontások és a sátrasok üldözése folyik tovább. And uh, meanwhile the uh, vengeance against uh, the hut dwellers and, and the demolition of their uh, shacks is, uh, is continuing. Zuglóban elértük azt, hogy a hajléktalan emberek feljelentették a el, szemétbe kidobott, elszállított utcaikért a polgármesteri hivatalt. Uh, in in uh, Zugló, the homeless people uh, started uh, some kind of uh, campaign. Kárterítés követelnek. Uh, they they want to get damages because uh, their belongings were uh, I don't know. Ransacked. Yeah. Is one olyan kunyhó bontás is, ahol az aktivistákat büntettek meg, mert megakadályozták a kunyhó bontást. And uh, also activists were punished because uh, they were trying to uh, do something against the demolition of huts. Kéréssel fordultunk az ombudsmanhoz és az alkotmánybírósághoz, hogy ezt a szabálysértési törvényt vizsgálják belül. So the uh, cities for all uh, try to get the uh, uh, court of uh, the constitution to uh, review this uh, law. És az alkotmánybíróság emberhez való jogok megsértéséért ezt a törvényt Megszüntette. So the constitutional uh, court find, found uh, unconstitutional this uh, law because of violating human rights. Ki mondta, hogy a hajléktalanságot szociális úton az államnak kell megoldani, nem pedig a hajléktalan embereket büntetni? So the court said that uh, homelessness is a social issue and uh, it cannot be dealt with by finding homeless people. Aztán 2012. novemberében, amikor megszüntették a szabálysértési törvényt, az ABM újongott. And uh, the cities for all uh, was very happy in 2011, in November, when the... 
2012, when uh, the law of this uh, contravention was uh, found unconstitutional. So but uh, the, this didn't last long. A főváros és a kormány bejelentette, hogy ebben nem nyugtanak bele. So the uh, capital city and and the government said that uh, they are not happy with this decision. Tarlós István azt nyilatkozta, hogy a hajléktalan emberek kizárják magukat a törvényességből, törvényen kívüliek, ezért úgy is kell bánni velük bűnözök. Uh, István Tarlós basically said that uh, homeless people are, are criminals and they should be dealt uh, as such, dealt with as such. Orbán Viktor azt nyilatkozta, hogy a közterületek védelmét meg kell oldani, akár a hajléktalan emberek kitiltásával is. Prime Minister Viktor Orbán said that uh, the public space should be protected and uh, if, if this means that uh, you have to prohibit the res residing of uh, homeless people in public space, then so be it. Az elmúlt 23 év alatt egyetlen egy kormány nem tett a hajléktalanság megszüntetésének érdekébe. So in the past 23 years there weren't any governments that did anything about uh, the homelessness issue. De a mostani Fidesz KDNP hatalom üldözi a hajléktalanságot, bűnösnek kiált ki minket, mert nincs tető a fejünk felett. But now this uh, government of Fidesz KDMP basically is doing a vengeance against homeless people and uh, saying that homeless people are criminals. És közben, and meanwhile, a szabálysértési törvény megszüntetése után minden jogszabály és törvényi rendelkezés nélkül Tarlós István, illetve a városvezetés Kordonokat állít fel az aluljárókban, ahonnan szintén kiűzik a hajléktalanokat januárban. So after the uh, law of contravention uh, was overturned, uh, István Tarlós and uh, the uh, city of Budapest continues to, uh, I don't know, taking out crash barriers to the underpasses and... Uh, basically prohibiting the residing in underpasses. A kordonok tábláin munkaterület, vizes fertőtlenítés, csúszásvetély van felírva, dolgozókat nem találunk ott. So uh, you, you can't see actually uh, work being done at these sites, but uh, the, uh, I don't know, the, the crash barriers or, or the uh, no, they they are saying that this is uh, the place where where they do work, and uh, uh, this this is the reason that the barriers are there. But you don't see anyone working. Aztán kivél fiatalok elkezdik ellopkodni a kordonokat, elvitik a felszínre, amik mindig visszakerülnek. So uh, civilians. Uh, basically disob disobeying the law and uh, taking these barriers from from the underpasses away, but uh, the barriers are always put back on their places. Az ABM innen is köszöni nekik ezt az együttérzést. And the cities for all is, is thanking them for doing this. Ennek kapcsán elhatároz az ABM, hogy csinálunk egy kordonos munkafelvételi akciót, Ami annyit jelentett, hogy volt egy munkafelvevő a kordonok előtt, és mi aktivisták különböző fals munka ö, szakmákkal szorba álltunk, hogy ugyan már munkafelvételre jöttünk, mert ha el van kerítve és nincs dolgozó, mi szívesen csináljuk. Uh, they made a mock campaign about this issue, and uh, they uh, went there and, and said that there's a, a human resources manager, and uh, if if he can uh, give work to them, uh, they will be gl they will gladly do this work, uh, which is uh, taking place in the underpasses. It's a crisis, it's a hideg ellenére, tovább folynak a kunyhobontások. 
And uh, in spite of this uh, crisis and uh, in spite of the uh, cold weather, the, the demolition of the huts continue. Volt olyan, amiről sajnos már későn értesültünk, de van olyan, ahol jelenleg tárgyalások alatt állunk az önkormányzattal, és Strasbourg-tól segítséget kértünk. Uh, there were few cases where uh, the cities for all were, was uh, late, but uh, in few cases uh, they uh, asked for help from the Strasbourg court. És ugye március 11-én megszabaszták ezt a törvényt, amiben megint belerokkanunk. Uh, in uh, the 11th of March, uh, this uh, law was passed, and uh, this will mean severe implications for the homeless people. Innentől kezdve megragadták azt a lehetőséget, hogy a hajléktalan embereket eltüntessék a nyilvánosság elől, pedig vagyunk. So uh, this is an attempt to uh, try to uh, make, make the homeless people go away, away from uh, the public eye. And, uh, and uh, this will not happen. Yeah, will not happen, yeah. Korlátozzák az Alkotmánybíróság működését, tehát egyszerűen nem lesz hova fordulnunk. So because the uh, court, constitutional court is restricted, uh, homeless people will, nowhere, will have nowhere to turn. Az ABM a hajléktalan emberek érdekében petíciókat írt, közmeghallgatást szervezett, jogszabályok felülvizsgálatát kérte, tárgyaltak, vitáztak, demonstráltak, polgári engedetlenséget vállaltak, de nem hagyjuk abba. So the cities for all is not giving up, they are petitioning, uh, they are uh, asking for the reviewing of, of these laws, they, they try to discuss these matters with policymakers, and, uh, and uh, they say that they will uh, disobey the law non-violently. It's just one serious question. A szabálysértési időszak alatt verték meg a roma férjemet és engem a rendőrök nyílt utcán. And uh, she says that uh, during the period of uh, the contravention law, she and, and her uh, roma husband were beaten in, uh, in the streets by police. Thank you for, for the possibility to be here and after hearing all this, I'm, so it's shocking, it's hard to talk about higher education and in the area of higher education the problems are not so obvious and shocking and direct as with homeless people but on the long run uh, they will um, affect all members of Hungary. So I'm the representative of Hallgatói Hálózat, the student network. We did the demonstrations in last December when the government um, started to demolish higher education and um, we made the demonstrations. We were there on last Thursday at the <coughs> Fidesz headquarter. We are occupying a university, at the, um, the faculty one, we are occupying one room at the Humanities Faculty of ETA at Astoria, and you are all welcome there. Our, our next forum will be on Thursday at 6 o'clock. So, the fourth uh, amendment has two parts which affects higher education. One is about the counselor system, which is about that the government wants to supervise very closely the expenditures of universities. And the second is the student contract. It's more known. Uh, it is about that Hungary wants to bind its graduate uh, <coughs> citizens to Hungary. So first I would like to talk about the cancellor system. Um, the government says that the universities are spending money um, without any reasons. They are. Um, they spend too much and we want and 
it's a crisis, so we don't want this. We will put somebody, the councillor, um, to the universities who will have veto power um, about all expenditures and who can decide about um, the financial questions. And they say that it will not affect the freedom of research and the freedom of education, which is quite strange. Um, I think that there are other reasons why they want to do this. They want to, they want to put their hands on the universities and they want to see what is happening there and they want to, um, want to make barriers to the autonomy of the universities. And, um, and one more reason, the third reason why they, they want to do this, to be able to compare universities because they, they say that there are too many universities in Hungary and we have to decide which shall survive and which shall, um, shall be deleted from the list. Um, and why is it bad? Why, why, is it, why is it a problem that they want to put one person who is in practice will be um, a trusted person of the government uh, to, the, to the universities? So the problem is we did it because it's, um, it's against the freedom of research and, and education. So they, they say that we will only uh, um, affect the financial questions of the universities and it will no affect on the freedom of, of education, but it's totally stupid um, because every research or educational cash question has a financial side and they, they put this reasoning into the, um, the reasoning of the constitutional amendment. Uh, and it, it's also anti-democratic because um, it leads to arbitrariness. They will put one person and this person will be able to, to, to make decisions alone about the financial questions of the university. And uh, there are um, there are things which uh, so there are examples for for this. For example, the fine arts university was in a situation that in one week they didn't know whether they can um, they can open on next Monday because they they didn't have enough money. And the gov government only announced on Thursday or on Friday that we we are so good we give you some extra money. So that's the arbitrariness in practice. So they, they want uncertainty and then everybody will go there and be nice to them to, to survive. Yeah. Um, and that the general, there is a general problem that why to put such a, a little issue into, into, the, in the, into the constitution and maybe because they are afraid that the constitutional court would set it aside because it's uh, because the reasons I listed. And in the current, they they say that in the current current situation there are no powers of the government um, to super supervise the financing finance management of the universities, but it's not true. Uh, there is one person now. In the universities, the, so the, the economic or finance managers of the universities are appointed by the minister. It, this person doesn't have such um, rights as the councillor will have, but still, the, the, minist the ministry sees what is happening inside the universities, and there are the general rules of, of legal res responsibility. So, if the university spends um, money without legitimate reasons, they can um, start legal procedure, procedures and, and so on. And uh, we believe in Hagatoy House that this is not, not, the, um, not the solution for, for this problem. So the best practices shows that to achieve more efficient universities and better mm -hmm. universities, it's, it's not done by from one day to the, other, uh, to the another. So we always ask the government in any, um, in, uh, in any questions to negotiate and start like a 10 year program, which, which is accepted by everybody and um, all, all parties and stakeholders are asked to be there. 
and that would be that would lead to a solution which is accepted by everybody and, and which can work and not like we decide on Monday we will put a counselor to the universities and there are three problems which is also a problem with the counselor system and also a problem with the um, student contract that the government never um, showed any studies or working papers why they do this they only said like general populist um, reasons for this um, the second general problem is why higher higher education the government is spending the same amount of money for social security or for healthcare and there are no counselors in, in the hospitals, for example. And, um, and the third one is, why universities? So it seems that the government is afraid uh, from autonomous institutions, for example, from autonomous media. We see the national media and um, the media authority which has very hard powers and also the Hungarian state television is, is not so autonomous today. <laughs> and if we think about culture, which is also a, an generally an autonomous part of, of a country, we now have the Hungarian um, Art Academy, which will decide on every financial question. So it's the same, like, you are free to do what you want, but we decide about the money and now the universities. And now to speak about the student contract. Um, the situation is that the government, so there is a, um, a law which says that the government pays your studies only if you work double of the time of your studies after within 20 years after graduating. So a, a three years BA means that you have to work under Hungarian jurisdiction six years within 20 years after graduating. And the first problem is with that, that it's against European law. It's against the free, move, free movement of workforce. And it's also against the Hungarian constitution, or if Ader Janos doesn't sign, <laughs> it's against the Hungarian constitution. And um, it has interesting questions. So it's anti this. So um, we have the the ethos of, of free movement of workforce and the the treaty on the on the European Union says that you you don't have to you know, so no no state shall be discriminatory and the whole thing was designed to 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 abolish discrimination against foreigners but this law is discriminatory against Hungarians and it's passed by Hungarian government or, or more likely Hungarians. But, um, mm, so, uh, I don't know if it's, imp if it's important to go into legal details or are you interested in, in cases of the European uh, Court of Justice? I think it's clear for all, all of us, uh, the government wants to control mm -hmm. the, 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 the universities, the great things, the mm -hmm. next generation to move them forward in the future the nation. And stuff like that. But what's your solution? What's your what to do against this against the new big problems to control so to say that we are gonna have another round. Oh sure, there are a lot of solutions also. I just have another question. I mean what happens if I what happens if I'm if I'm an EU national uh, without being a Hungarian national and come yeah, to study in Budapest? And yeah, you, you know, have. I mean, do I have to study yeah, that after that? According to the <laughs> Hungarian code, because it cannot be. I mean, it's not legal to charge me because I have the same rights as Hungarian residents, so they cannot charge me. I mean, I can't. Have but they, the same they rights, can. So they they charge uh, Hungarians. Or yeah, well, I mean, they cannot charge me over and above yeah, what yeah. the Hungarian. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting charge. question. So, so yeah, I mean, if a if a foreigner comes here, according to this amendment, they will also have to work after under <laughs> Hungarian. <laughs> Uh, jurisdiction, or 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 they have to, or they have to pay back the cost of their studies, and and this is not only a theoretical question because there are a lot of Hungarians living abroad, like in Romania or Slovakia, and for them it's a question. Yeah, um, and why is it bad 
for some further reasons why it's bad. Because it's like the government mm -hmm. wants an ownership about their their citizens, which is which is like in a dictatorship. So they want to decide whether you can go abroad or not. And one fun fact is that a, a similar um, law is only in force in Belarus and Hungary. <laughs> and Belarus is not known as the most democratic country of Europe. And one more problem is that it's one-sided. So the students have to stay here and the government, government tries to, to make to give them uh, workplaces. So it's one-sided because we have to stay here, but the government doesn't give anything on the other side. And it's also against solidarity, because those who are rich and can pay for their studies, they can go to the Western countries, can, can earn more, and they will be even more richer. And those who are poor will have to stay in Hungary and, and uh, will stay poor. And um, the government says that we, so Hungarian government, gives the money to the citizens, and so they have to give it back. But there are a lot of European Union money in, in universities, and that's funny that they claim that you have to give back this money, or you have to work. Approximately like eight percent. Sorry. Approximately 98 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if I uh, so uh, just uh, I I, I uh, don't speak about uh, the the uh, daily uh, expenses, but 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 the the, the um, uh, about renovations of, of 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 the yeah it's 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 the general number all um, renovations and um, yes. But developments. All, all developments are financed. So, 95% of all developments yes. in Hungary are financed by the European yes. Union. Um, yes, and one last thing that there is the problem. So, the government sees the problem that a lot of Hungarians want to leave the country and they do not want to deal with the reasons and do not want to resolve it, but they set administrative barriers to this. And history shows it's, it rarely works. Thank you for hearing me. Um, I'll try to be quite short for several reasons, one being that we're quite late, the other being that I lost my voice in the morning, so I really tried <laughs> to be brief, but uh, the, um, the, the, the issue that I will talk about is the definition of family that the uh, uh, parliament has passed to amend the constitution to include a specific definition of family as uh, family being based solely on marriage or on a parent-child relationship. So um, if you read just the text of the, uh, of the constitutional amendment, you will also see the definition of marriage as a union between a woman and a man, etc. That is not something to do with this present amendment that has already been in the constitution uh, before. Uh, I mean, with the fundamental law that was adopted in about two years ago. So what's new now is the, uh, not that it, this uh, definition of marriage will also be extended with the definition of family, which will clearly link the institution of family to marriage. Just a short uh, legislative overview of how this happened. Um, basically, with the adoption of the fundamental law, the fundamental law prescribed that the parliament adopts a cardinal law on the protection of families. There was no such law before in Hungary. Now, this was something that the new uh, fundamental law prescribed to the Hungarian parliament. And the Hungarian parliament adopted a legislation, a very strange legislation, a cardinal law on the protection of families. Uh, and I'm saying strange because this um, legislation uh, contain the definition of family and then contain some very, very general provisions uh, which do not directly translate to any, any rights or any, any, any legal measures. So things like, for example, education should help uh, uh, or the education uh, system should uh, deal with the issue of families. Or things like families should be, uh, or certain uh, benefits should be granted to families. It remained on such very basic level and there were uh, uh, and it also contained the definition of family 
a definition of family which linked family solely to a marriage and, and in, in that sense, in, or in that, the original version, to filiation, so parent-child relationship. Now this um, um, provision in the cardinal law was um, um, taken by the ombudsperson to the uh, Constitutional Court, and the Constitutional Court at the end of 2012 found that this um, limited, very exclusionary definition of family is uh, unconstitutional, basically because it, um, <clears throat> it excludes a certain, uh, um, certain uh, family settings uh, that should be recognized as families, and the Constitutional Court gave a long list of of family settings which should be treated as family but are not uh, covered by this definition. For example, uh, of course, um, cohabiting couples, and we are talking now about heterosexual couples who are not having children, are not treated as family. Uh, for example, a couple in which they do have a child but the child only is a biological child of one of the partners but not of both of them would not be treated as family. Uh, a family setting in which uh, two uh, elderly sisters or elderly <coughs> brothers live together, uh, but they're not, uh, of course, married and are not in a parent-child relationship, would not be treated as family. So the Constitutional Court basically said that <coughs> um, even though there, <coughs> there exists in the Hungarian legal practice this idea that, that family means uh, most importantly marriage and, and parent-child relationship, there are also other family setting which should, under uh, what they call sociological definition of family, also be treated as family. Uh, so this was the constitutional court decision back in December, and uh, of course as a response to this, the government is now um, putting that definition of family in the constitution itself. Now of course the question resides why, or, or arises why uh, an, an LGBT organization or, a say, or an organization which deals mostly with, with the rights of same-sex couples uh, comes in the picture. Interestingly, the original uh, petition by the, by the ombudsperson to the Constitutional Court also addressed the issue of whether this uh, definition of family is exclusionary or discriminatory based on sexual orientation. The court said no. The court said they don't care about that. That aspect they, don't, they didn't cover. They said this is not a problem. Um, so even though we are you know, campaigning against this uh, uh, provision, actually it's not something that, 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 that directly affects uh, same-sex couples as the constitutional court decision which, which now uh, is being overruled also was not very progressive uh, uh, for extending the right of same-sex couples. Now the question arises because for the other um, issues that were covered before, it's very clear what will be the result of these things. For homelessness, it will be that the criminalization of homelessness will be put into the, uh, the, the act on misdemeanor and that these uh, provisions will be put in the law on, on, um, on higher education. It's not clear what the results will be of, of this definition of family in the, in the Constitution. Uh, this definition of, uh, of family was used, for example, as an art argumentation in certain, uh, concerning certain uh, provisions in the civil code. So the original uh, civil code is um, basically a very general uh, piece of legislation which describes all kinds of uh, family law uh, matters. And this uh, previous uh, definition, which will now be made into the Constitution, was used as an argumentation against extending the rights of cohabiting couples. So, for example, this would, uh, the new uh, civil code would have um, uh, offered limited, um, <coughs> limited uh, inheritance provisions for cohabiting couples. So, for example, if a couple has been living together for 10 years, then uh, not only for married, but also for, for uh, cohabiting couples, they would inherit uh, from each other automatically without a will. So this, for example, a very specific provision was, um, was, took, was taken out of the civil code with, with reference to this notion of family. Um, also, uh, there are plenty of other very obscure legislations in Hungary which also refer to the notion of family. And when I say obscure, which means these are not very you know, direct and practical things like, let's say, inheritance or what happens with your child. Not legislation like, like that, but very general references to family. For example, in the media law. The media law says that all media broadcasts in Hungary should um, respect uh, the institution of family. Now, if family is uh, understood in this very exclusionary sense, of course, then it could be used against uh, certain media, um, uh, media broadcasts, which also are open to other forms of uh, 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 um, you know, um, broadcast um, information about uh, same-sex couples or same-sex families or simply say that the rights of cohabiting couples should be uh, treated equally or should be granted. Um, now these 
might be made uh, um, uh, might be outlawed by uh, the media authority, which which has to uh, supervise that the, the, the that the media broadcasts are um, uh, respecting the family, the institution of family. Also, for example, in the uh, the <clears throat> the legislation on the content of, of public ed uh, public education. So basically, what should be taught in schools? It also says that. Uh, uh, that education for family life should be a key uh, competence and a key area of where the schools should be active. So if we take into, this con into consideration this exclusionary definition of family, basically schools uh, should teach to kids that only uh, uh, relationship based on marriage or only sexual life within marriage uh, is normal, is okay, or is moral. And we actually do see that, uh, that just recently a proposal came out from the government about the very content of what this education uh, for family life would, uh, should look like in, in uh, public education. And it very clearly says things like the, the primary role of schools is to, uh, to educate, to educate uh, youth in order for their gender identity to correspond to their genetic gender. Um, this is what the schools should do. Um, also, uh, saying things like the primary role of sexual activity should be reproduction, or the primary place where sexual activities should take place is is um, is fa is um, is, ha is um, um, marriage. So these are the things that that might result from this um, taken. Just is this out already? I mean, is this, <clears throat> this was a put up for consultation a week ago, and the consultation closed no. yesterday. So it's might be made into legislation in a few weeks' time. We'll see. So, um, also the question very often uh, arises, in Hungary we do have a registered partnership, so this is an institution very similar to marriage uh, for same-sex couples. Whether this new provision in the Constitution will in any ways affect same-sex couples? Directly, no. So directly, there is nothing in the Constitution which would mean that, uh, that, the, um, uh, that the registered partnership institutions should be abolished or the rights that come with it should be uh, infringed upon. But the problem is that this constitutional provision makes the, the ground for, uh, or, or do, does away with the constitutional protection of this institution. So basically, if the government decides in half a year time to cut back on the rights of, let's say, registered partners or, or cohabiting same-sex partners, then the, the constitutional court will no longer be able to to use the argumentation that before they will they were able to use because that then there is this exclusionary definition of family in the constitution. Mm -hmm.